Okay, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. So this uh, session is giving an introduction to Groundswell Agronomy and Groundswell Benchmarking. Uh, so just to give you a bit of history, probably be about five, five, um, five years ago, we really wanted to ask the question, is conservation ag truly reliable for and profitable in the UK? And at that time, there was no data really that you could look at, financial data, to, um, to prove that this was actually the case. So the way that I felt we could do this was actually to get a decent sample of farms together that are actually doing the system properly and financially benchmark them against the rest of the industry. So um, both Gary and I were working with the Cherries and we felt it was a natural opportunity to develop this and work together. So Gary's been collating the figures and presenting the data now for all the Groundswell events. Um, it's providing some really useful information. And as that sort of evolved, John and I were uh, having a conversation one day around the kitchen table and we were sort of really debating the future of agronomy. I don't know if anyone came to the talk yesterday about the future of agronomy, but we were really trying to provide solutions to that question. And we came up with the sort of concept really and the idea that as the system evolves and you move away from the product being the solution to the system being the solution, that actually the role of the agronomist is going to change drastically. And the model that we started looking at was the agronomist longer term will become more of a facilitator of a discussion group that also combines benchmarking. And if you look around the world, the, the benchmarking groups that work, because benchmarking in itself is fine, but unless you have the context of that financial data, it, it sometimes can be meaningless. And in experiencing dairy groups that work incredibly well, the dairy industry is very good at benchmarking and very, um, very successful at that. And what was really working well there is that everyone trusted each other and everyone was comfortable sharing the information. And so we wanted to replicate that and grow that. And so we've been doing that now for several years. And we've got two farms here, uh, two farmers here joining us who are both uh, in within the benchmarking group. And they're going to talk about their experience, but also their their farms as well. Um, one of the things alongside that, we felt that the actual agronomy is going to change very much so like I say we're moving away from a product to the system being the solution and so therefore we're moving more to a consultancy type model rather than a traditional crop walking because as the system becomes the solution it's not necessary to do that traditional crop walking but it's more about strategic longer term advice which is the way the organic model works. So I'm going to um, hand over to Gary now, so he's going to give you an update on the figures, uh, the benchmarking figures, and talk more about the actual context for, for where we are. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thanks, Richard, and, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Gary Markham from Land Family Business, uh, and we are strategic tax advisors and accountants, and, um, but we, we find that quite boring. So what we do is benchmarking, okay, so, and, and benchmarking this new way of farming. So as Richard said, we've been doing it for, for several years now. And so I'm going to go through um, some a bit of the background of where we are. And so we do benchmark all of our clients, which is several thousand acres um, in, in the eastern counties. So we have that as a base, if you like. And then we have this group of a dozen or 15 farms that, uh, uh, that have been uh, running Regen Ag and uh, so we can compare both systems, which has been really useful. So uh, that's me at, at the beginning there. I'm just going to move forward. So a little, a little bit of background. So, so where we are in, t in terms of um, general agriculture now, if you like, traditional arable is what we call it, our LFB benchmarking. So we've got LFB benchmarking and Groundswell benchmarking. Okay. So the reliance on, on BPS uh, is, uh, and if you look at the 19 harvest, 84% um, of the very bottom line, which is the bottom line, which is a rural business profit, uh, uh, is 84%. Uh, and because the obviously the 20 harvest has crashed quite a lot, 147% of the bottom line profit uh, on our, all our benchmarking is made up of BPS. Interestingly, obviously the top 25%, those are the averages, the top 25% this side, um, that's 53%, fairly consistent. Uh, now that's because there's heavily, a lot of uh, diversification. 
in, in the top 25 percent and they're relying a lot more on, on income from outside Arab oil, if you like. Uh, so that that's some of the some of the background. So um, moving forward a little bit, just another bit of concept about uh, capital, capital land value. Okay, so uh, the actual economic uh, break-even economic. Uh, a gross margin from the fund around about £4,000 an acre, okay, in terms of, of capital. And the rest of it, if you take an acre as being eight to twelve pounds sorry I'm dealing in acres because we're after Brexit, what we do. So, um, um, yeah, hopefully. Um, and it's two and a half times more accurate, actually, than, than hectares like my acres. Yeah. So, so that, that, and the rest of it up there, you know, that we've got that capital tied up in the industry. Uh, that, that where's the return on that? So the only return on that extra bit will be chimneys and houses if you get development, if you're lucky enough to get development. So otherwise, in the industry, we've got that that top bit there tied up in, uh, uh, in the farming business. Okay. So in the so what we've, what what's happened in the past is. Many or most of our clients are expanding, okay, which is which is what we've done, mainly through contract farming. So let's just look at um, what what happens or what has happened here. So these are actual figures over the last two or three years. So in hand farming, pounds per acre on the left hand side, with naught in the middle, which is, which is naught profit, okay. In hand, 68 pounds, okay, per acre, bottom line. Contract farmed minus 66. So if you spread your labour and machinery across the whole uh, of the whole in hand and contract farmed area, the total area if you like, the, the, even though the spread la labour and machinery is less than the income from contract farming. Now that's because many people have expanded and paid for key money, so expansion in the past to spread fixed costs does not work. Okay. These are average, and obviously an average is, is, is an average of a range. At top 25%, there are people that do make money out of contract farming, but on average, people do not. So expanding through contract farming has not worked. Okay. So, and that's a bit of a background. I think we've got questions afterwards. It's okay. So, uh, um, a question after I've just finished a couple yeah. more slides. Okay. Yeah. So, so, we've, so that's the expansion point. So, what's the answer? So, we've been looking at regenerative agriculture uh, on this this farm here and other farms, um, as Richard has said. So, moving forward, a couple more slides. Uh, so, some of the key findings for the regen ag systems. Okay. Uh, the average output over the last few years. Uh, um, in terms of yield versus price, it's about 20% lower, 21%. Variable cost 18% lower, and the gross margin is 24% lower. So here we go. And this this is this is the confidence part of part, part of doing it. Bottom line there, the bottom bullet point is key in this. Labour and machinery costs 32% lower. Okay. So, and so everything is lower, okay? So what are the margins, you could ask, and, and I'll pro probably say now what the margins are before somebody asks. So the, the, the Groundswell Group margin per acre, okay, net margin from arable farming is 11 pound an acre, okay? And this is arable farming, okay, alone in, within the business, just the arable farm business. Um, and that's after the five variable costs, seed, fertilizer, chemicals, labor and machinery. And that's what we are benchmarking. And that's what I believe is the true benchmark of our farming. So we're not looking at other parts of the business and rental income, etc. So the five variable costs, just the arable proportion. Net margin, groundswell group, 11 pound. LFB, conventional farming, over the last few years, three pound. Okay. So after all those figures, um, the, 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 the regenerative agriculture margin is higher, slightly higher. There's a huge variation, but this is £11 versus £3. Obviously nobody makes money out of arable farming, apart from some people of course, maybe some here, but on average you do not. 
you're relying on other parts of your business to make to make money. So those those are the margins. So a couple of more. What are the key KPIs that we have developed? Because we're looking at a lower, a lower margin, okay? So you could have a cost of production per time way down, you know? And you see these cost of production per time figures uh, published, but they're absolutely meaningless because you would have a very low cost of production per ton on two tons a hectare, okay? And you could have a lot higher cost of production per ton at eight tons a hectare. So where's the profit? Obviously, the eight tons a hectare, the higher cost of production. So cost of production per ton is not something to look at. It does not give the answer. So what we've developed is machinery capital per ton. So basically, what we're looking at is the ton, the yield, okay? The biggest influencer of profit is machinery capital, which is depreciation. And depreciation is, a lot of people think depreciation is witchcraft. It's not cash, it doesn't go out the bank, what is it? And, and we, we've had discussions in, in the, the meetings we've had where um, on, the, on the agenda, Gary, can you please tell us what depreciation is you know, in an hour? And how boring is that? But that's what people want to hear. So, um, so the, key, the key points here are, that, as I said, the main driver of lack of profitability uh, in arable farms and machinery costs. The viability of arable farms is destroyed by the amount of the, the value of machinery these days, unfortunately, and inflation in machinery has been quite high. So we've developed this, the Groundswell Group um, uh, 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 indicator machinery capital per tonne of winter wheat, okay, which and uh, it is £74, you can see it there, uh, LFB conventional system, £91. Okay, so that takes into account the two people, so two key points. Here. So if you've got, we've got a lower yield, Okay, we've got a lower yield, the margin's the same, but we've got le less machinery capital. Uh, the difference has been, I think it says, 20, 20 30 pounds per tonne all the way through. Now, to me, that, 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 that slide is really, really important. It actually shows uh, the key differences. One more to go. Um, so this is, this is the last slide, and anybody who was in the audience uh, listening to us yesterday, we'll have seen the same slide uh, in terms of the future of agronomy. Hopefully, not too many of you. Um, uh, so, what we've summarised here is uh, the variable costs. So we got one one believer there. Variable costs 175 pound. Um, conventional on the left, okay, 175. Machinery capital 320 pound, and that's the key figure, as I said. Um, so. Top of, top of the slide, that arrow going across to the right is Regen Ag, which is to the right. Variable cost on average £144 per acre, machinery capital 220 And you can see everything is lower there. The other very important point that is not in our figures, and this is a very important point, um, it is, is on a 750 acre farm that equates to 100,000 less capital. So if you start, if you've got 100,000 overdraft, move into Regen Ag and, and achieve the same arable margin, which is about breaking even, which is what we do in arable farming, then you, you, your overdraft is written off. Okay, so um, so basically we're, we're in a situation now where the goalposts are moving for, for all of us. So in, in a rugby context, the goalposts are now not in front and back, they're on the sides of the pitch. And we'll tell you the rules later, chaps, to carry on playing. And I think that's where we all are at the moment in terms of agriculture. Um, just to finalise, the numbers on their own um, are not enough. And I think these chaps will probably say that. We've, I've been throwing numbers at them, but we've been doing other things that they'll talk about. We have workshops and meetings, etc. Um, and I think the last, I'd like to, like to ask a question, actually, Richard. I haven't spoken to you about this. Okay. But, uh, it's always good to put the uh, chairman on the spot, is that? So, we're, we're facing, obviously, BPS reduction, huge changes in the industry, okay, aren't we? So, and we're facing, and what we're going to do, Elms coming in, etc. So, is it the right time to change the Regen Ag with all those other changes going on? Which is a bit of a challenge for us, and I suppose a challenge for all of us, really. Is, is so, you know, would you... Would you change the Regen Ag system whilst the BPS is phasing out? Or is that too much to, to deal with in one day? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. So we've got um, time for 
for any questions, if anyone would like to ask Gary a question before we move on to our, one of our next speakers. Okay, no questions. So I'm going to introduce um, Mike. So Mike is from Whitbread Farms. He's the farm manager there, and he's going to talk to us about introduce the farm, and then talk to him, talk to us about his experience with with Regen Ag and the benchmarking group and and the groundswell, and also sort of feeding into that groundswell agronomy and your thoughts on the future of agronomy. Good afternoon. As Richard said, I'm Mike Pennell, the manager of Whitbread Farms, which is 20, 25 miles north of here, um, so nice and local to pop down. Um, the farm consists of 1,000 hectares of arable, um, 200 hectares of environmental, in mainly in HLS, which is about to expire, but also mid-tier, and 80-odd hectares of um, grassland, which we now mob graze with uh, British white, rare breed, pedigree herd, and sucklers. Um, the enterprises kind of are a bit separate to each other. Um, we we want to introduce cattle back into the arable rotation, but at the moment, the infrastructure and indeed the, the, the weight of the cattle, perhaps rather than the sheep, puts us off doing that. Um, we're six years into probably started as conservation ag, I would say there's a slight difference in, in definition. Conservation ag now we definitely regen ag, which means we are um, full cover crops, full catch crops, big rotations, really trying to hammer down the inputs to the main one at the moment, the main focus being nitrogen fertilizer for cost and for environmental credentials. We are currently, according to the Cool Farms Hall and the Carbon Cutting Toolkit, carbon negative and we're negative not because we've offset against some woodland our wheat is negative our rape is negative in the field it's grown in um, and we've got a lot more work to do to get to be more negative at the moment that's just through organic matter rising over the over the years of chopping straw rather than selling it and cover crops cash crops and we're starting to introduce uh, purchases of organic manures as well um, we run a, full, a fully commercial farm, um, that's, that's how it's set up, and the, the figures through the, through the benchmarking can help us uh, just keep on track. The, um, I, guess, I guess internally, and I've got a meeting tomorrow about it, about machinery, because it is, it is quite easy to collect machinery, even on a system where you're supposedly machinery light. Um, we're not particularly horsepower heavy, because actually one of the more useful figures that Gary's had for us in the past has been horsepower per hectare as well. And we are pretty slim on horsepower, but we do seem to have quite a lot of stuff to hang behind tractors, I might argue. Um, and, and perhaps we need a bit of a clean out. Depreciation, I'd agree with Gary. Gary is, is a killer. Um, having said that, we've just bought a brand new seven cuts of bread this year, so my figures aren't going to look quite so good next year. Um, at the farm itself, I've only been there a couple of years, but I think I think we're bred to be benchmarking for the for the whole time of, of the um, of the benchmarking. And, and it is very useful for with all benchmarking. I do HDB benchmarking as well, but then your men your men benchmarking, you need to be benchmarking against the industry because you need regen out to stack up to the rest of the industry. Um, but equally it's quite difficult because you're comparing such different systems and system, different cropping. So actually within the re within the ground floor bit that is that is handy having people on the same system and might upset Gary to know, but he says accountancy is a little bit boring. Benchmarking doesn't really set me on fire. But um, but the, we, we, we meet up for a day, half a day or three quarters of a day for um, in, last year, not very often, but you know quarterly, I think. Um, and actually, the, the discussion with other like-minded people is is is, um, is is a very good part of the day. A bit of a farm walk and a discussion. So it works really well. It just helps us keep on keep on track, really. And on that, could I just ask um, Gary, livestock obviously are an important part of the Whitbread farm, and how do you feel that is able to be sort of managed within the benchmarking context? Yes, yeah, so uh, we've just, I think we we didn't include, like, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, we didn't include livestock uh, until the last, this last 12 months or so, but we've now brought the livestock margin into the arable rotation, so it's part, part of part of the, uh, of, of the, of the results uh, and uh, quite a few of uh, 
not just the Regen Ag, actually, uh, quite a few of our other clients as well uh, are bringing uh, livestock, particularly sheep, um, into into uh, into the system. So uh, well, I do run uh, several, many machinery syndicates over eastern uh, East Anglia, uh, anything from five to ten thousand acres, and it's um, it's really interesting. I like helping young people into the industry. So if you've got anything between five and ten thousand acres, you can get a sh young shepherd in to bring five hundred ewes in, free grazing, free shed, uh, and, but we tell you where to graze. And that works really well because you know arable, far arable farmers only have dead sheep, don't have live sheep. Um, so, so if you bring a shepherd in with a sp to specialise and to look after the flock, and it helps a young person in as well into the industry. So, but we're bringing yes, we're bringing into the margin in terms in terms of the, the benchmarking. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Gary. Are there any questions for Mike um, at this point? Yes. And can I just ask in terms of the the discussion group? How do you feel in terms of the format and the subjects? How does that work for you? And have you picked up anything to be useful from those discussions? The discussions are what we what we what we turn up to the group to, to want to discuss. It's, it's, there's no sort of set agenda on what we're going to discuss. So um, yeah, if I'm not happy with what we're discussing, then it's up to me to suggest something to discuss. Um, so. So no, I mean, discussions are good and the format's all very well. Um, I guess the one thing I forgot to say was, going through Gary's figures, the, and, and I've already had this conversation with Gary, the figures are the figures, uh, and, and figures don't lie, but I, I personally believe that um, if I'm doing all this work to make my soils better, I'm not going to accept the fact that I get 21% less yield than anybody else. Um, I want to get the same as my conventional neighbour, um, hopefully from less input, but I, if I'm making my soils better, why does that? I don't see. It's something I've got to get over in my head. But but I don't I don't understand why that should give me a lower yield, and I just accept a 20% lower yield. So I want the same yield, but with all the benefits of decreased cost. So yeah. So before we have the question, so uh, I think the other point is we do not calculate the value of of the increased organic matter in the soil. So in, in, all, in, in all, all the numbers, obviously, are just the number, the cash flow numbers, the profit and loss accounts, and the conventional, conventional numbers, obviously, but there are other benefits that we, we may be looking at car, uh, putting a value on, on, on carbon, and, and so up, that the carbon is coming in as a value over, over the next few years, we hope, that obviously. So we, we could actually bring that value into the benchmarking as well, although we've got, as, as Mike said, lower yields, etc. But we could have, have that, then that brings the, uh, the, the, the increased organic matter in the soil as a value coming in as well, potentially. Okay, thank you. We'll take a question here before going to our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. You you mentioned the the reductions in in, in uh, artificial fertilisers that, 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 that you're applying, um, and probably you've got similar sort of reductions in uh, pesticides as well. Uh, they're probably two pretty key areas for benchmarking and the, the sort of. Uh, the ability for, for your cost to be at, at, a, at a lower level. Um, can you comment at all what, what the variation is within the um, Groundswell benchmarking group? I mean, do, do, does, is there a massive variation or are you all at a, at a sort of similar level? I, I, I picked up from another seminar that some of the, 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 the larger growers are not able to take the risks with that's a reduction in, in fungicides because they can't get around their area quick enough to deal with the problem if one arises. Could you, could you just touch on that a bit more? Um, probably not. Probably Gary's better one to answer it than me without wishing to pass the buck because he looks at, um, at all the figures um, and I haven't particularly, if I'm honest, studied the, the, the figures for this year only came out um, on last week, and, 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 I, and I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't studied them through, but um, I know certainly um, AHDB, they, they compare your nitrogen input, and is it something that you do, Gary, or not? I can't. No, not, no. not, not to that depth, no, we only do variable costs, okay, so we, we, we keep this benchmarking based on just the numbers you've seen, um, it's, it's not designed to go into detail in terms of variable costs, but it, it gives the overall overall margin. In my opinion, it does give it does give the the results we want and, and creates a discussion point. But the, but the the variation is huge. 
Absolutely, it is huge. We're huge in bottom line as well. So if you come to our stand and, and have and come and look, we've got a handout on the numbers, um, which are we've got there, Richard. Um, yeah, so so the numbers do vary from uh, per acre minus 90 to plus 102, as they do in in conventional benchmarking as well. There's huge variation. So in a conventional benchmarking, we have um, uh, top 10 percent. Top 25 average uh, and the bottom 25, and that, and that vari variation is huge. The variation all the way through the numbers is the same in the Grand World Group as well. And I think it's important as well that it's, it's always the context and the discussion group element. It's, it's never separating the two. I think it's so so important, and that's you can see that the groups that work are, are always doing that. So, so that's pretty important. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to hand over now to Rob Raven. So Rob farms in Suffolk and also manages. Almost, is it 10,000 acres or more than 10? Okay, around 10,000 acres. So Rob's going to talk about his experience of the discussion group. And um, Mike didn't touch on the sort of last point about his thoughts on the future of agronomy. I'd also ask Rob to talk about that. Maybe we can come back to Mike's thoughts on that afterwards. Well, uh, yeah, I'm Rob Raven, farming on the Norfolk Suffolk border. Um, we have about 1,500 acres that we farm in hand and contract farming. And then, as Richard said, we provide contract farm management services to a couple of country estates which brings up to about 10,000 acres in total. So on our in-hand farming operation really we've been direct drilling for sort of 15 years plus and um, I feel like we've got that working pretty well. It's predominantly back of series clay so it's a high yielding land and, uh, and does reliably produce some good crops. Um, we've actually been lucky enough to recruit Richard as our agronomist um, across the bulk of the land now um, because we wanted some, some expert advice on how we can get further with input reduction as well. So um, like Mike, we're doing a full range of uh, a wide cropping rotation, incorporating cover cropping and livestock to, to manage and graze those cover crops. And um, so so that's where we are. And I've recently joined the Groundswell Benchmarking Group, which uh, has been really useful because otherwise we're, we're a bit of an island. We don't have anyone to really compare ourselves to. Uh, whereas with the Benchmarking Group, we've got a group of farmers who are all doing a similar type of thing. As you've mentioned, there is a wide range of, of um, results all the way through, which gives us something good to discuss. You can, it's a small group, so we can sort of pin each other down and, and try and analyse how someone is doing what they do, and where they're doing better than we are. Um, and uh, yeah, so and I think the future of agronomy really, I, I hope we've taken this step already by recruiting Richard, because um, really, we had several weeks all through the autumn when Richard would walk the crops, I walked the crops, and after a long discussion, the result would be we're not going to spray anything this week. And uh, really, that's the most valuable type of agronomy we could ever have because rather than having these blanket applications across the whole farm, we really need to we need to get it so that we're only applying what we need to where we need to. Partly because of cost, we've all got the same costs, but also because of the wider environmental impact of, of unnecessary spraying. There's no way every field needs the same thing every season, year in, year out. If you're going to do that, there's always no point having an agronomist because you can sort of use the same reps you had last year. So I feel like we've, we've made big inroads. Uh, I look forward to next year's benchmarking results where we can, we can see how much, is, how much the variable costs have come down. And uh, I, hope that, I hope the harvest will be a bit better as well. Okay, Gary, you wanted to say yeah, something? Yes, so, so thanks Rob. So, so I think the key thing is, is that the numbers are just part of the process. Uh, I think that's the key message we want to give. Uh, so we, so we this year, I think we're going to meet three times. We, we met once already on this, on this, this here on this farm. Um, and as an example, we went round, and saw a few crops, and then spent an hour, an hour and a half, I think it was, in the grain store, in a big circle. And, and that was key. And, 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 I, and I think that's where um, the, the numbers come out anonymous. You all guess who you, are, who you all are because you know each other really well. Uh, they do come out. You do come out anonymous. However, in the discussions afterwards, and that is the key. That it's not. It's not just the numbers and the benchmarking. Is the the, the, the key point about the variation is the discussion in that grain store of, of who's got the highest and lowest and why. And that's where and that that's where the huge benefit comes. So so the numbers are, are just a catalyst to the discussion. And one thing we've noticed uh, within the group is that everybody's results are starting to get better. And, and I think that is the, the, what we call knowledge exchange, I think, um, it, which is a, a key term these days. So, so learning from each other and, 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 and getting better. And that's what I've noticed over the last, the last uh, four or five years in, in the group. 
I think also a comment in terms of um, talking about, particularly yesterday, the future of agronomy, one of the biggest challenges is peer pressure, and it's great to come to an event like this and leave feeling really inspired. But I was just going to ask um, both of our farms here their thoughts around peer pressure and how they cope with that um, back on their farms. So I don't know if you, Rob, you'd like to start. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, um, we, like I said, we started direct drilling 15 or so years ago when it was quite unknown. And, uh, and think it, it looks really different to conventional farming. There's no nice level brown seedbed. You've got what looks like a scruffy stubble and then slowly the crop starts to emerge from it. And I think about two or three months later, the neighbours might be able to guess what you're actually growing. And uh, in the meantime, they can't even tell you've drilled anything. So I think we were always considered something of an oddity. Um, thankfully, when we started, we weren't doing any contract farming. We weren't working for anybody else. So we really didn't need to consider what anybody else thought. Um, which I think was, was a big advantage. I think if you're managing somebody else's land um, who might not be as committed to the system as you are, then the thought of having a scruffy field um, might put people off. Um, but that said, we, we got into it quite gently. We never saw any big yield dip or anything. We sort of, we probably plateaued and then got good at it and now things are back up where I'd want them to be. Um, and now we're reducing inputs. That takes another another sort of leap of faith because you might say, well, yeah, we can see some weeds, but, uh, but it's not going to affect yield. It's going to look funny when they poke up the top, um, and if people want to laugh and point, then then they're welcome to. But really, it's uh, it's about the bottom line at the end of the day. And um, again, it's not just it's not just about saving money. I'm firmly in the belief that uh, whenever we put on an input to the crop, there's collateral damage, and we 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 harm non-target species as well, which obviously has wider environmental impacts. Um, but it's also not good for our farming. I mean, we've all seen where you get spray overlaps of a herbicide one year, and then the next year, the following crop doesn't come through in those overlaps. And I always think, well, if a double application is enough to kill a following crop, then a single application is probably not doing any good. And uh, I'm sure we've seen as well, when, when you have blanket insecticide sprays, that takes out your beneficial insects, and then you get slugs coming on, and you have to come on with slug pellets. So everything that we can avoid, I think we really should avoid, not for altruistic reasons particularly, but because I think it's better for our crops and our soil. So, no, I think you do need to be, be sort of confident in what you're doing and not think too much about uh, the peer pressure side of things. Okay, Mark? Not too much to add to what Rob said, because I think it's, it's all very um, pertinent. I, my, the owner, my boss um, on the farm, takes a view of if you assume that every single input is bad for the soil, then justify using it. We're not organic by any means. We're, uh, not particularly drive to get to be organic, but actually there's an awful lot to learn from organic people and their processes. Um, apart from we can sort of reach for the emergency uh, emerging sector if we need to and, uh, and, and try something a bit different to, to, to solve the problem in a, in a chemical way. Um, but yeah, you take that principle that it's, it's all bad. Uh, it's surprising me how few people out there sort of have, have ever read, well, it's not interesting reading, but are aware of like the worm toxicity data that's on, um, on all your um, pesticides. You start reading that, and that very much changes your your what, what chemicals you're using, in what situations, um, because it, it clearly states on all these things actually the damage that it does to your to your earthworms. Um, as as for the the future of agronomy, I, I, I yeah, um, agronomy as we know it, as it was 20 years ago, is dead. Um, what we've got to be careful of is there's not a load more salesmen just coming around to sell us something else. Um, because yeah, we can soon spend our money on loads of silver bullets, um, but actually we want to be cutting inputs, not just spending the same money on different stuff. Okay, thanks Mike. And um, just going past the audience, are there any questions? Uh, has anyone got any more questions? Okay, um, Gary, have you got anything more to add or would you like to say anything? Yeah, okay, so so uh, I think I just want to just reinforce what I've just said really is, is that is that the num the numbers on their own don't give don't give enough confidence. I do give a lot of talks to agronomy groups uh, on traditional traditional farms and I can read have not in the last COVID time but obviously before that. And um, and I've had audience around about thirty or, uh, in, in, in audiences saying that they've tried regen ag and then then lost their confidence and come back again to the traditional, and I and I think that's that's what I'm finding in most of our clients is that is the confidence thing. Haven't, and this goes back to the peer pressure as well, I guess. 
So it's it, it's 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 the, it's giving giving the confidence, and as Rob has said, you know, he's do, doing all that, and uh, and the neighbours didn't know what cropping was growing until something came through, uh, because everything is growing there. So I, I think it, it, the, the confidence, and I think going back to the, the point I said earlier on, Richard, about uh, BPS changing, you know, it's a, it's a huge impact on. We've got we've got talented farms um, with overdrafts, you know, so. And, and it's survival, uh, and, and, and so, and it's taking risks, and so, and so, is, and to, to to enable people to get it to ease across that, that I think that's still up there, across that that arrow at, at the top. It's all about um, the confidence and and the future of agronomists. As I said yesterday, agronomists need to be therapists and psychiatrists as well as uh, uh, moving forward to, to help farmers make that change. And so, anyone that's not familiar with the Groundswell Agronomy Group, and it's and it's a relatively new, uh, new starting project that began last last summer, really, basically. So the the basis is that it's it's an approved list of Groundswell agronomists who are running their own businesses, um, and they have a diverse business. And I think this is the interesting thing: is how do we go from where we are uh, in terms of generally conventional farming? to a more regenerative system, and that's a very much a journey, and that will depend on the size of the enterprise um, as to how long that takes, and the diversity of the enterprise, and, and also the risk factor as well. I think that's a really important element that comes in. So we've got a range of agronomists around the country, uh, and they, they're consultants in their own right. So if anyone's interested in talking to them, they're at the, the Groundswell stand, and if, Gary, if anyone would like to talk to Gary more about the benchmarking figures, um, Gary's also available to speak. Um, I'd just like to ask if there are any more final questions before we... Um, okay, Louise. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so in five years' time, really, the question that a lot of farmers are asking me is um, how is how is regenerative agriculture going to work sort of in the post-BPS phase, which I think is a fair question applies to all types of farming of course but um, but really that's what we're all looking at is can we can we make a business that works without that 200 odd pounds a hectare BPS and um, really my view on is I think despite despite Gary's pessimistic outlook I think that we can match gross margins to conventional farming um, without too much problem I really believe that's true and uh, if we can go from that and then save 100 pounds a hectare on on uh, the fixed cost which I think is quite easy to do when moving to direct drilling and then save £100 a hectare on the variable costs through, uh, through you know, intelligent use of sprays and inputs. Um, we've got the £200 a hectare made up. So I think we're, we're already on the right track. Um, on my particular farm, we've, got, uh, we've, we've sort of got as far as we can with direct drilling. I think you know, we basically direct drill the crop and then we do our applications and then harvest it. So there's not much more we can do to reduce our fixed costs there. You've got to plant it, you've got to harvest it. Um, but we are making good inroads now on the on the inputs um, and also one thing that's been useful for us is as we've gone from a, the sort of traditional plow based power harrow system um, to direct drilling I mean we can drill our farm now in you know four or five days it's really quite quick and easy uh, and that's that's allowed us to do all the contracting and have the time to go and do to do the other work so we're, we're using our experience and our machinery and our skills to to sort of do more work off the farm without it impacting on our own farming at all so so I think that's that's where regenerative agriculture can help the farm make a viable business post BPS. I guess for us, um, the question was asked to start: Can you can with the BPS declining, can you afford to now try something else, um, which may be considered high risk? Other people would argue: Can you actually afford not to try it, um, and you should be getting in sooner rather than later. We already know my my views on, on yields and, and Rob's echo the same on the gross margin, so I don't think there should be a gross margin disadvantage to what you're doing. Probably actually directly on the farm I'm on. Um, we already actually budget without BPS anyway. That goes into a separate bank account. Um, we the, all the diversification, the commercial, the residential goes into a separate bank account. The farm accounts sit on their own as as a mixed um, as a mixed farm. But mainly an arable farm. The environment I get in my um, comes into the farm budget. So 
we will carry on doing we'll carry on with the environmental scheme. Hopefully one day soon someone will tell us what Elms will be, but um, we will carry on with mid-tier, hopefully convert that into an Elms. We hope we will be able to monetize carbon, but we're not doing anything. We've got a very specific goal of if there's if there is some subsidy out there, we're not going to change our direction of travel to, to get that subsidy. We're, we're quite fixed, and the, the route does change, but we're quite fixed on where we want, where, where our route of development is, um, and we're not going to deviate to the side to grab a few quid, because if we don't think that's particularly helping us and, and supporting our system, um, the chances are that it's probably not going to, we don't, we're not, you're not sustain, it's financially sustainable if you're still looking for a handout. So actually if we want to get financially sustainable, there's other things, and there's some private incentives. I think we'll be doing some private incentives by the, by the diversity offsetting, hopefully to sell carbon. I would imagine one way or another we will have some more livestock on the farm. Markets wise, hopefully markets will develop, but people will be wanting to pay a bit more and there will be a premium for low carbon or carbon negative produce. We're already trying to only grow produce that goes to human consumption. Um, trying to get all the, the benefits of, of, of that premium, but yet we can have a low carbon human consumption premium. I can't see us being full of loads of trees in our fields. Our fields, quite frankly, aren't that big. I know that's probably being negative about putting trees in fields, but um, you do need some efficiency as a farm. So I, it will develop, but I don't think we'll be vastly different. Okay, I'll just ask Gary for a comment as well. Okay, so thank you, Richard. Um, so the, the way I see, uh, looking across the board, not just at region ag, no, just at all of our clients, um, I think well-being is, is 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 one topic that's high on my agenda. When I go and see, I've I've had clients in tears in front of me, um, looking at the future, and need and you know wanting how they're going to feed the family, you know, and so particularly tenant tenant farmers. With, uh, with with overdrafts, etc., as, as a classic example. Uh, so well-being and depression is, is a key point, I think, in the industry. Uh, it's a very lonely job, and, and I go and see families who are very traditional but don't know what to do. So I see the future as collaboration ticks so many boxes, uh, and, um, and and not contract farming, as you probably saw. I'm not a keen fan of contract farming, and I'm not joint ventures. I don't know what Rob will think about that, but I see share farming as the future. So I think that uh, machinery syndicates uh, with, with joint, farmers joining up, pooling their machinery, and a share farming agreement alongside that, so they, they're share farming, so that, that is robust with HMRC in terms of, uh, of, of, uh, of capital taxes, and, and etc. And, and I think uh, farming together, so therefore you do get uh, the, the, peer, the, the, peer, the peer point that solves itself because you've got half a dozen farms. The problem we have, we do not have any machinery syndicates at the moment because we don't have enough regen ag farmers in groups together. It's, it's, it's been obviously it's increasing as we've seen on the number of people here. So, and I'm really looking forward to getting machinery syndicates into regen ag and, and regen ag. So, so taking the taking the uh, benchmarking forward into practice, if you like, um, on, on on in farming groups, sharing machinery and share farming the crops, and, the, and I think that's my ultimate aim. And I hope I'm around long enough to see lots of those coming on board. And can I just ask, what are the biggest barriers to joint ventures being successful, and you know, and more more farmers adopting this? Yeah, sure. So, so the the, the, the barrier is price per tonne. So obviously we've had a bad harvest in 20 harvests, but two pounds a ton, and I've spoken to clients who've averaged 200 pounds a ton of wheat, um, and so it just follows the profits really. So once you have a good harvest, people don't collaborate, but you you need. So I think the BPS reducing down is really going to force collaboration, which is going to be really good for the industry. You know, that, you know, although it's looking looking at the bright lights. Uh, really of, of the BPS uh, coming down. And it's going to force the industry into a good place, I think, in terms of collaborating. Ticks the well-being box as well. And in terms of time scale, which actually getting joint ventures up and running, how, what do you find is a standard time frame for that? Because yeah, that's okay. so, so uh, joint ventures, it's so important to do uh, several meetings beforehand, and it, and it takes six to nine months, I would, I would suggest, to be healthy. <laughs> You jump into it 
uh, too soon uh, and I've come across people who have jumped into it and found they're not compatible. So I spend a lot of time meeting people making sure their balance sheets are similar because you, you've got different financial strains on different businesses. You want to make sure that the, the balance sheets and the borrowing, etc., uh, are, are similar, compatible, um, and, in, and that you don't have too many, too many chiefs. So you want about one or two chiefs, and then the rest just drop back, and that, that works really well. And so it's not retirement, of course, but it's uh, it's farming. And one of the one of the the key points that have been made: the terminology it brings the fun back into farming. When you join a machinery syndicate, you know you're all together, and and, and we we benchmark machinery syndicates as well. We have a, a machinery syndicate benchmarking group uh, yeah. that we do, and we have uh, AGMs that we. Uh, that, that we have on each 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 group, so we, we run it in a sort of a corporate style. The key point, I think, going back to machinery, which is a, um, as I said, kills the viability of arable farming, um, is is that the scrutiny that, that that people like like Richard here gives to uh, to the variable costs, with, with by by pulling the machinery into a separate limited liability partnership or an entity, you have that equal scrutiny into labour and machinery. And, and that is fairly new into the industry because most of you, I guess, have farming businesses and I would challenge that you the, the scrutiny you would have on labour machinery is not enough because it's just there as a fixed cost. By pulling that out into a separate entity, sharing it with your neighbours, so everybody's looking over each other's shoulder, you get that scrutiny into labour and machinery. And, and that's a, a, a big plus. Okay, thank you. I'd just be interested to ask Rob and Mike what they what their feelings are around joint ventures. Well, I think um, I, I mean I'm involved in lots of different farms in a real variety of different ways, and uh, and I mean you can call it you can call it um, share farming or contract farming, but from my view, it's all it's all collaboration. It's all effectively spreading machinery and expertise um, across the optimal acreage so that everything's sort of fully utilised, but without anything being stretched. And, uh, and so, yeah, I think that that is certainly the way it's going. And actually, the more people are involved, the more opportunity there is for, uh, for more machinery sharing and closer collaboration. And I should have said that's one of the ways I can see the future changing is with some of the farms I'm working with, we've got different bases and different machinery fleets, but as machinery becomes due for replacement, it would make a lot of sense for us to synergize where we can and pool resources. We are doing it to a certain extent with grain storage and sharing equipment. And I, I can see that just developing as, as, as the trust grows and you know we're lucky enough to have several farms within close proximity where you could possibly share combines or you know the big ticket items so so no I think that's a big part of it. it it's not anything I've got experience of and I guess it'd be dead easy to um, say when well, it wouldn't work for us but then again if I took that opinion, we wouldn't be doing regen ag either because I was told that wouldn't work on that land. So I guess it's something we probably need to look into, um, but it's not something we've had any experience on at the moment. Um, are there any more questions before we... Uh, yes, sir. Have you worked on about sending your rotation? Does it work? What have you done that way? And, and what are your key, like, when you think about new uh, things to bring in, what do you consider? Is it like an input thing? Oh yeah, nothing about that. In, back in history, again before my time on the farm, as with most, I guess, people in sort of East Anglia, Bedfordshire, they grew wheat break, wheat break, wheat break, and then discovered that it broke the farm, both in terms of um, the ecology and indeed the, the wheat pressure. So, I guess that was the real um, driver for trying to do something a bit different, and we're now we've now built up to an eight-year rotation. Um, milling wheat still is the backbone; it is the bank filler. So we're trying to grow as much as much as we can do in the rotation. So three out of eight years are milling wheat, two years are spring crops, and then there's rape beans. So I mean, the, the rotation at the moment would be something like um, rye, rape wheat, beans, wheat, spring crop, wheat, spring crop, and then you're back around to the start again. So we've got the legume in there, we've got the, um, well, we've, we've got um, broadleaf in there, we've got the milling wheat, we've got a variety of rooting, a variety of organic matter, we've got the cover crops, overwinter cover crops, we've got catch crops. Um, 
hopefully we've got you know some sheep grazing the cash crop. So we've got a load of a load of different inputs, a load of a, a, a different chemistry coming on the land. Yes, one of the targets was reduced nitrogen off the farm. Well, it's dead easy. You grow a block of beans, therefore your average across the farm is reduced. But it's kind of cheating because the real project was to reduce the nitrogen on the wheat. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to grow our own nitrogen where we can with clovers, with with the cover crops, with um, under sowing stuff. We've just we've just moved it on. A bit of a target we've got maybe is 30, 40 percent spring cropping, 40 percent broadleaf crops, and not just going down the grassroots all the time. Okay, Rob. Um, Fairly similar to Mike, I think really. We've got a, a big range of crops on the farm. I don't have a fixed cropping rotation. I really do uh, sort of just make the decision as the year as the year progresses and if there's any particular weed issues that'll affect my following crop choice. Uh, but in general, we're, we're not really doing second cereals as a general rule. Um, we'll have wheat is still the backbone. I like to grow as much wheat as we can sensibly without it compromising anything else. And then we have beans as a, another mainstay. It's a really good break crop. We found that they are inherently very low input indeed. Um, we can grow them for very cheaply, home safe seed and very few inputs. And, uh, and, and we find that they suit the direct drilling on the heavy land. They're, they're good margin on their own and they're excellent, excellent first week following. And we have all seed rapers in there, sort of low risk, low cost all seed rapers, so that if it does get taken up by flea beetle, we can come back and replace it with something else with very, very little cost sacrifice. And uh, we have linseed, we have winter barley, spring barley, spring beans, winter beans, um, got some rye. Uh, really, I'm happy to try most things if we can find somewhere to put it. Um, and yeah, I think just having having all of them as an option, and we're very good at keeping home safe seed available, so that if uh, if it turns into a wet autumn and we don't finish drilling winter beans, we don't have to rush out and buy a load of spring beans, we've still got them in the shed for us to dress from. So just keeping your options open and trying never to get in that position where, uh, you know, things have gone against you and you've got to rush out and buy some seed when everything's when they've run out and you have to scramble for stocks, I'd like to avoid that altogether. So, so yeah, no fixed rotation, I'm afraid. Do you have a sort of target nitrogen goal you'd like to get to, say, in five years? What are your thoughts around that? Well, I'm not sure exactly what the right number would be. We've uh, we've we've tweaked it down. We've gone for a lower total this year on all the all the cropping in general, um, with with some tramline trials. So we've got some. We've gone. We've sort of gone for about 180 kilo average on the weeks. Some of it's pushed up to 210, some it's down to 150, so we can see what difference it makes. We actually would have gone for more like 150 average and then tweaked it from around there, but we had some quite thick crops and then we had a lot of rain in May and I thought actually these crops have got quite a lot of tillers coming, quite a lot of potential. If we don't feed them, they're going to get a lot of, a lot of unfilled grain. So, uh, and also I don't want to take down the opportunity to actually make a margin out of farming when we can. So, um, so we did increase it a little bit. But yeah, going forward, the idea is to always do tramline trials around hopefully a decreasing average to see at what point it becomes uh, you know, injurious to our bottom line. Um, but we are also taking into account that putting on more nitrogen than needed is going to have detrimental effects elsewhere. So I'd rather slightly undershoot and then save on the fungicide side and, and the risk um, than overshoot and then get a drought and it doesn't turn into anything anyway. So, um, so I don't have a fixed target there again. I don't, I don't know exactly where we're trying to get to, but I just feel like it's a uh, you know, if we can learn to do it with as few as possible, that reduces our risk this year and it increases our um, our ability to cope with with the future as products become unavailable, um, or there's incentives to, to not use so much, or not incentives but sticks and legislation around it. Okay, thanks. We've got a bit more of a target. Um, which again, we let's talk. We, we spend most of our time talking about wheat because and, and the rest of the stuff sort of just happens by the side. But we, I don't, and this may not even be may not even in 20 years be realistic and achievable, but I've got a target of producing nine tonnes of group one wheat with 100 kilos of applied air. Um, we've got some trials this year with various bits of technology, well not technology, but a few couple of products where we've gone down to 135, um, and the combine will tell me where we get to. Last year, I, tried, I did grow nine tonne, but with, with 100 kilos of applied, but the protein was through the floor. Um, so it's doable to get the yield, um, is the quality. And, and, and try, by gro trying to grow group one, that kind of a little bit ties your hand behind your back. But if you can do it with group one, you can do it with, with anything. 
effects? Yes. It was going to be a trial this year, but it just, with weather and things, I'll be honest, it never quite happened. But yes, we, we, we've, for, in, in, the, in the planning, and certainly for next year, it will be um, a block of wheat just grown with foliar up nitrogen and just see how low we can get it. The other things we're doing is we've got, um, we'll be, we've got trials with it now, but basically we'll be rolling tiros out across the farm. As you see, it's the only seed dresser we'll use. Don't bother with fungicide to seed dressings. Um, we'll be we'll rolling out with tiros across the farm, which hopefully should save us 20%, you're told. Um, try and use foliar and other places. We'll use nitrification inhibitors just to try and increase the, increase the efficiency. And that's then with, a, with other crops with um, either grown over clover bed or intercrops, that's the way that they were sort of trying to bring the rest of the, um, the numbers down. Yeah, Bob, have you ever had anything? Uh, we haven't tried any, any fairly applied nitrogen as of yet. Thankfully, I'm in an excellent benchmarking group and I can pick my experience next year to see how it's got on. Um, but certainly, it's, uh, it's introducing beans, which is reducing the average across the whole farm, but also reducing our requirement for the following wheat crop. And I am quite seriously considering trying some of this um, undersown clover to see if we can keep some of that alive and direct drill through it. But certainly, the direct drills like going through some living cover if possible. And so, uh, if, that could, if that can make some inroads, then that would be. A, you know, a win-win, both in terms of ground cover, weed control, and also nitrogen applications. Okay, and if I can finish with just a uh, last comment from you, Gary, I don't know if you're seeing trends within your, your client base around inputs and, and, and sort of how people's thoughts are changing. Yeah, very, very mixed. Yeah, I, I can't, I, I don't think I've seen any trends at all. I think um, everybody is just waiting Wait, waiting to see what's going to happen basically uh, within the group as I said we've seen if we have trends of course but in general um, no, uh, there's no recognised trends at all in the thousands of acres it was obviously a very large group um, in terms of the rest, the rest of LFB benchmarking um, so no, no no trends at all I've recognised ok well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this session and I'd also like you to show your appreciation for our panel. Thank you.